No, no, that's kind of like why I like the long form conversations. You know what I mean? I, you, you see these five, six minute interview type stuff with, about you know dogs and dog breeding, and you really don't really get the whole picture, and it's a lot of fluff and and uh, bravado, and and not a lot of substance. And and I guess that's just pretty much the whole internet age period. That's it. But then, to be honest, if if people are fooled into listening to five minutes and they're convinced, then, you know, more for them. You know, yeah. a fool and his money is easily parted, you know. Uh, what would I do if I'm listening, if I'm going into a different breed and I'm talking to somebody, I want to listen and then I want to go and I want to think and I want to come back with questions. And, I mean, this is another reason, that, you know, I have pubs. You could sit for hours with pints of Guinness and you could change the world and talk about everything. And, you know, there you really get to the root of things. It's not with a five-minute podcast, mm -hmm. you know, at a distance that you're going to get any anything of meaning, you know. You've got to, you know, to, to think. And, you you know, I remember many, many years ago, uh, uh, my first business, I needed a, a business angel. I needed an, an investor. And I, and I fell onto a, a just pure chance. I, I got a meeting with a very, very wealthy man. And um, it went very well and all the rest of it. And he said to me, you know, uh, he started, he said, yeah, listen, you know, I'll back you, no problem. And um, I remember running into a few little problems. And I remember saying to him one day, yeah, and this, you know, this isn't... Uh, it's just not fair and the rest of it. And the guy said to me, listen, you know, don't expect me to do it all for you. You know, you've got to find your own way. You've got to sort of dig and, and look to what you want. And that stuck with me. It's the same thing in dogs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll often get people will send me a message, you know, and say, um, uh, give me uh, some accurate um, historical information on the breed. <laughs> That's, that, that's not for me to do, you know. I can give you a couple of, you know, lines. Have a look here, have a look there. But you've got the internet today. I had, I had to go to a public library. You know, I had to, we're, we're talking way back. Today you've got everything at your fingertips. Have a look, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, contact people, talk, discuss, make your own mind up. You know, um, show me that you've, you've done a little bit. Don't expect me to give you all the answers. Show me that you've, had a look around and then come to me and say, well, listen, I had a chat with this fellow. What do you think? And I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll know. That shows me that you've done some of the work, you know. You, you know, you, you get what you put in. So within dogs, again, how many times people, I'm talking about bloodlines now, and the vast majority of the people, they glaze over. You know, they, they have no interest in what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Rappery or Bell Knight or Bedge Green or Spadil or Stockade. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, they're, they're not interested. I'm thinking if you're looking to get into breeding dogs, you have to know this. You have to know that it's important. You know, but it's, we're not going to change, change, change the world. We're not going to change the things, but it's, it's maybe worth thinking about. This is why, like you say, the, the podcast that we do is, is kind of like sat around a table with a couple of drinks, although we're, I don't know how many thousand of miles apart, but it's, you know, the exchange of ideas and opinions. That's, that's the, the interesting thing. So on, those, on that line, talk about the importance of pedigree for you when you're about to uh, mate one of your dogs with an outside um, bloodline with an outside dog well I'll be honest I when I set up my breeding program I had uh, a couple of dogs that were not too closely related so I had that margin that, that, that area to work within mm -hmm. and then I had one of the bitches was mated to an outside dog an outcross and I kept a male so that gave me it was kind of like, I think Levitt did the same thing years back. You have, you have a female with, with two related males, and then you work, and then you guard another female. And so you run two sort of lines, two family lines at the same time. So with selection, you never really have to step out. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, if I was 
if I had to step out in pedigree breeding, I would want to know what I'm bringing in. Because many, many times you bring in not just the good stuff, but you bring in a lot of crap as well. Yeah. So my lines have worked and reworked and rinsed and any faults that have come to the top I've, I've worked on. and So I know where I am with my stuff. I can't guarantee other people's stuff unless I really have a look at what they've done. Now, if I was going to make, uh, for example, one of my bitches, I needed an outside stud for whatever reasons. What I would do is then uh, go to work in doing my own homework at, at least three generations behind. Because beyond three generations becomes historical. It's, it, it doesn't, it's very rare that you're going to have something four, five, six generations back affect your pups. So you're going to need to know what's behind in the three generations. And you're going to have to know the, the family side, the bitching side as well, because very often people just look at the males. What did he give? What did the grandfather give? But what about the females? The female is just as, if not more important than the males. So what were the females like? Have you got, you know, maybe a contact number for somebody that had a good female from this line? And you start doing your homework and you start asking the right questions. And only then you go ahead with the mating and you cross your fingers. And you cross your fingers that all comes out right. As I said to you uh, earlier on, I did a mating with a very popular dog here. It was very well known. And um, the resulting litter was a surprise. A lot of stuff came out in this litter. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when I asked about you know what was behind, one person said, uh, no, no, I've got no idea what you're talking about. And the other person said, uh, oh, yeah, but that, that crops up all the time in this other line. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, again, very often breeders tend to cover uh, cover up their, their, their faults, uh, which is only, it's the same as me. It will eventually see the light of day. You know, if you've got something, for example, you've got, I don't know, uh, uh, problems with uh, with teeth in your line, it's going to come out. Uh, um, if you've got problems with, I don't know, cherry eye or a problem with dysplasic dogs or whatever, it eventually will come out and it will be traced back to you. So it's better to be honest at the beginning. You see what I mean? So uh, if, if I was looking at going out, I would not do it on a whim. I would spend at least six months to a year uh, assessing and studying and, and contacting as many people as I could behind this stud dog to see if, if it's compatible with my bitch. You see what I mean? And then you you know, you can only do so much and then you cross your fingers and Mother Nature and Lady Luck have a, a lot to play in it as well. And then, as I said in a previous podcast, it's down to the selection. When you've done the mating and it's gone well and it's come to term and she's had her pups, then it's down to you, the breeder, to have the eye to pick out the good stuff, you know, sell the, the rest um, and be honest. Mm -hmm. No kennel blindness here, be very realist, be honest. Sometimes you can make a dog, the mating takes place and the, the pups are just average. There's nothing in there. You know, you're not always going to get, you know, uh, corkers, uh, winners. Sometimes uh, some, some matings click, some don't. So you can only put the maximum of sort of stack the maximum of things in your favor. And then after you just hope for the best. Right. Right. <clears throat> so we kind of touched upon a little bit about this, but... Um, the state of the confirmation shows what... In your perfect world, how would a, a show that would highlight um, more of the workability of the dogs and the breeds instead of just the, the popular uh, look and standard of, of today, what would a proper dog show look like for you? Funnily enough, I turned up in France in 1994 and by the time I sort of got my bearings and found out where I was and uh, 
you know, met a few sort of like-minded people. I went to a dog show in a place called Nantes. Nantes was uh, it's on the west coast uh, up the top. And this dog show was one of the best I'd ever been to because every breed had its speciality. For example, you had, um, I think it was the... Um, the Bouvier Biennoise, whatever it's called, they they had these dogs pulling little carts. Um, you had the Newfoundland dogs in a lake with the guys with their, their combination uh, wetsuits getting, getting pulled along, you know, doing the fake on drowning and the dog comes out to them. Then you had the gun dogs and they had the sort of mise-en-scene where you've got the guy shooting and the dog goes off to pick up the decoy. And each breed had a, a little sort of workshop atelier attached to it mm -hmm. and it was fantastic it was a huge place there were hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of people families it was uh, educational uh, the the pedagogy was was top it, it was really really well done and they only did it for a few years and then it proved to be too expensive and then they kind of just went back to being the regular dog shows again and it was such a shame because it was fascinating even breeds that you you know you weren't really interested in when you actually see them at work you know you had your, your, your german shepherds attacking a guy in a costume and then you go to another place and you see another breed of dogs doing something so it was you know the disneyland of dogs if you like uh, and that i thought that that that's if you could do that, you know, even if it's a couple of times a year in different parts of the country, that really would be something to put into your diary. Now, I appreciate the investment, again, with any business model, it's the investment against the reward. Probably, and it was the case, it proved to be too expensive. But, for example, I saw you had Marco from Quinlan um, uh, on the other day. Mm -hmm. He's got um, developed a thing with his Staffords. It's like a decathlon. There's a, a ten event day that the dogs have to do all these different events, and they get school. And it's a very good idea. It's, it's a lot of the other countries around Europe adopted the same sort of thing, and it's a good day out where you see not only nice looking dogs, but you also see what they can do. And it's not about who comes first. It's about you know the dogs taking part. And it's a very good idea. It's, it's enjoyable, it's a good idea. But again, it's... Unfortunately, if you're talking about a physical breed, you need to have a look at its physicality. You need to have a little look at what it's... You know, like a five-second trailer, what this dog is all about. Just having a beauty competition, you're just not doing... A, a, a service to any of these breeds it's just you know you see the white bull terriers and then putting the chalk all over them to make them look extra white and you know what's that all about you know and it is uh, it, all, all of these when you've got a beauty contest you kind of only catering to maybe 25 percent of the whole potential of the animal now they it can be very good if it's done right, okay, why not? But if you're talking about a physical breed or a working breed or, you know, any type of breed that, that, that has a function, I think the clubs involved or, you know, maybe not the official clubs, people involved should put on some sort of, not a spectacle, but some sort of um, way of showing what the dog's all about. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It's got to be uh, an athletic event to show what the dog's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say it's far more interesting from a, um, you know, from a, from a, a, a pedagogic point of view to see what the dog's all about. Maybe you know, bring a bit of history to the table. It's not for everybody, but you know, these terriers, you know, came back from this date and that, and it's first mentioned in Latin, and you know, you could touch on that it's not for everybody but you you kind of bring to the table that it's not just a fluffy dog you know there was a lot of history involved to bring it to where it is now um you know the standard is the standard and if you follow the standard your dog then should be able to do this this is where people again should be able to read a standard 
for example, how many Stafford owners have come to me to say, I bought a Stafford, I'm a sporty kind of person, and the dog, after the first couple of uh, kilometers, I have to carry him to the vets. Why? Because the breeders didn't adhere to the standard. You see what I mean? Maybe they they have bred the dog uh, to 40 centimeters for the shoulder, but they paid no attention to the weight. So this little dog is maybe 25 kilos, his belly's touching the ground. But because it's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, it's considered to be a sporting animal. Why isn't my dog sportive? So then you have to explain to them, well, listen, you know, you've obviously brought something that's a little more maybe, you know, uh, for the show world, not really for the, for the, for the sporting world. But the standard is just very general. So the show people will defend their choice and say, no, but my dog fits the standard. Yeah, but you're not following common sense. Your dog's not in a fit condition or your dog's got over-exaggerated head or shoulders or feet or, you know, you've stuck to a standard with closing your eyes. You know, you haven't. Is it, is it natural? Can your dog do all the things natural? For example, you know, English Bulldogs, they can't even lick their own asses. You know, no. so yeah, the dog turns around. You see him; he's spinning in circles because he wants to scratch his own ass, and he can't. You know what I mean? So again, we're we're back into the subject of exaggeration and and show animals, and you know how people kind of lose sight of what it's all about. Yeah. I did a thing called the Bulldog Bash. I used to do it for my customers and friends. We used to have a, over 100 people each time. And what it was was um, a big get-together with a huge barbecue. I used to pay for it with my, my bars and my restaurants. So I'd finance everything. It was free for everybody. And there was a huge barbecue. Everybody could come, beers and soft drinks and stuff. And uh, there was a little agility course and bits and pieces. And it was just a place where people could come and share uh, stories they, they could come together and it was funny because some, well, I had a couple of police officers that were uh, were customers and there were some guys from the inner cities there as well but suddenly they take off their their sort of day hats and they join together in the same passion which was great you know they're all talking and and it was it's what it's all about it's the the, the essence of of, of the, the hobby of dog breeding or, or it's everybody's getting together and there's none of this com competitive nastiness. It's all about, you know, let's have a good time and talk about, you know, the, the reason that brings us all here together, which is the stuff to whatever dog. And, you know, we can have a burger and a couple of beers and, and it's a good time. And you see what I mean? Out in the open, you do a thing with, you know, a big field and there's maybe some little obstacles for the kids to play on. And so you're doing something with a sort of positive message behind it yeah. they were good that, that was good but again uh, in Italy the other day it was a, the, the, the event I judged the first day sport they do their sports and then the next day these sporting dogs are then judged on the sort of beauty side of things mm -hmm. but it's more of a fun day but you know they bring in a judge to judge these sporting dogs that have already proved themselves. So that's good. And I mean, I predicted years ago, I said, the, the classic beauty uh, dog shows are losing uh, appeal rapidly. And on the other side, these sporting uh, uh, events with fun shows uh, attached to them are gaining in popularity. What does that say? That, that's saying that they, you know, the, the greedy people the, in the kennel club or whatever haven't addressed the issue, and they're not giving a product, if you like, um, of value. They're not giving something that's more and more expensive to to put your dog into a dog show, and there's there's, there's no value for money, you know. So I think if you're going to be doing events, uh, your particular breed, you should make it interesting. Yeah. Again, it's, it's the same with anything. I mean, if you're selling something, it's got to be of quality. So if you're selling an idea or a day or something, it's got to be quality. So you need to invest a little more time. It's not about just pulling in money on pedigrees. and They, they need to think about, okay, you know, um, thanks to the, these dogs, we're in this nice position where we're all driving nice cars and 
you know, we're all coining it in. They need to give back a little bit more. And try and have a think about, you know, what makes a good dog show. Um, the country shows, for example, they've still got it. Because you can go to a country show and there's the, they're judging all the terriers, but then you've got the, the little stalls all around where the guy's making hand-crafted walking sticks. And it's very country, so it's, it's interesting. You're there, but at the same time, there's, there's things of interest all around. Crufts. Crufts before was excellent because you used to have antique stores, you used to have uh, painters, you said, so it was, you know, you could be, look at the dogs and then go for a walk and buy a few things and, and it was of interest. But your average dog show today, you go in, you pay your entry, you sit on the chair if you can find a chair, um, and then you have to wait until five o'clock for the big ring. You know, even if your dog got chucked out at half past 11, you know, you've got to stick around and wait. Uh, you know, you've lost all interest. So again, the quality of the, the, the service isn't what it should be, in my opinion. But th this this is the problem with a lot of purebred, you know, the kennel club dogs or the, the pure, we'll say pure, pure uh, uh, breeds. Anything that's n not pure for them is considered a mongrel is bad it's you know they're, they're so hooked up in you know it should be perfect you know they're not as you say thinking outside the box uh, if you you look at you know all breeds there is something else in there it's, you know there's no real pure breeds i mean you know paper hanging has become a national sport <laughs> you know so uh, People should just accept it. Okay, you know, if you want to buy, a, I don't know, an English Bulldog and you buy it from the paper, you expect an English Bulldog. So you don't want somebody to cross their Pekingese or something with a, with their Bulldog. So what you're after is somewhere along the line saying it's pure, it's a guarantee that I pay my money and that's what I'm going to get. Yeah. Now, if you're talking about working dogs, um, these guys, I mean, the Australians, the... the, the these guys just do the pig dogs. They'll cross deer hounds with bull terriers, with doggos, with this and that. Wonderful, because they, they are there. It's like an artist with an open palette. You know, they, they will produce, um, you know, they're looking to produce. They're not just doing it willy-nilly, you know, I'll just put that over that and see what it happens. You know, they've got a goal in mind. Is this dog going to catch pigs? Is this dog going to work? And so they will breed, obviously talking amongst themselves, what works in the field. You see the difference? They're not harbored in a, in a sort of prison. They haven't got these boundaries where they're not allowed to even think outside the box. They can do whatever they want. This is the beauty of, you know, you've got your patterdales. Everybody's got their own recipe in a patterdale, what they prefer, you know. Some like a bit of, uh, you know, pit in their dogs. Some like a bit of Lakeland. Some like a bit of Yag. So everybody's got their own little idea of what will work for them, which is good. The trouble is, when you, especially with internet, once you even mention to somebody who is blinkered, that, you know, maybe a, a bit of hybrid vigor wouldn't go amiss in, in their chosen breed. You know, it's like you know, you're the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So, again, what I've learned is I, I don't respond to uh, things like that. I have my own ideas and I know it's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, I know all the top lines. I mean, we, we talked about this in the last podcast. I mean, for example, in the working lines, everybody goes to the pit. Why is they go to the pit bull is because it's you know the number one for working animals you know so it genetically it's pure why because it's the hardest selection you know so everybody goes over to the pit for whatever i mean today you see jack russell's across the pits you know you've got the lurchers that have all got the pit blood you go um that's just the way it is you know it's the hybrid vigor and it works mm -hmm. the bull terrier is becoming more popular in crosses people are crossing bull terriers with everything you know the the original battle cross was the stuff in the bull terrier i mean they they produced winners in the pit you know your, your psychos and your stormers and all that they all had bull terrier behind only they never produced much mm -hmm. you know because funnily enough mother nature gets involved and and even though the battle cross works very well, uh, it doesn't produce like. Right. You see what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's, you've got to, 
you've got to know or at least know people that have experimented and, and tried these things before you can uh, start casting an opinion. If you are in the purebred uh, world and you start casting accusations at people, well, I know you're, you know, you're, you're breeding mutts. No, you no, yeah. You are um, embarrassing yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's stupid to say such a thing. You're breeding crossbred mutts. They're mutts. That's cool. So you, you've got to, you know, look, for example, in working dogs, the proof is in the pudding. Can the dog catch a rabbit? You know, can it catch a badger? Can it, you know, is it useful? Is it functional? Does it work? That's where the buck stops. Um, rosettes and little cups that the dog wins in a beauty contest stops there as well. Your dog may be very pretty, but, you know, that's where it stops, begins and ends there. A dog in the field has to prove that he's his worth, you know. So this is why I see that very often, you know, you, you're in conversations with people that do all these you know, weird and wonderful crosses. And if it's done right, I'm, I'm with it. But, you know, the, then you've got the counter-argument at the refuges of um, the, the RSPCA and the, all these sort of rescue places are full up with these, these mutts because people have been indiscriminately breeding. Yeah, okay. But most of the workers I know, they, they keep back what they want and they dispose of the rest. You see what I mean? So you're talking about a subject which is taboo, crossbreeding, and then another subject behind, which is extra taboo, culling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can you talk to a group of fur mums and say, yeah, well, I cross, but anything I don't need, I bury. Uh, no, that's not going to go down very well. So, it's, you know, th these are the subjects that, that um, basically upset people, get people's you know, blood boiling. But... I think the minute that you bring in strict rules and regulations, you limit the um, potential of a breed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I told you the famous story. I was once in a, a yard in, in, I think it was South London, and uh, to see uh, some dogmen and a very well-known face from the, the show fraternity pulled up in his car, and he had a bitch in season. And obviously he saw that the guys talking to me were busy, so he quickly drove off. And I said, oh, I recognize him. I won't say his name. And the guy said, yeah, well, he'll often bring one of his kennel club bitches here to be mated. And then he hangs the papers because he thinks that the character's gone in his line. So it's always gone on, you know. But uh, again, like I say, paper hanging is an art form these days. So... But no, I've got nothing against crossbreeds. I'm all for them. Yeah. Crossbreeds are great. Yeah. Crossbreeds, uh, again, if you're going into a line which is too pure, Mother Nature will step in and she'll start, you know, basically deteriorating the immune system and then you've got problems coming in. Your dogs are dying. Your dogs are dying young. Your dogs are getting cancers. Your dogs are getting all these sort of illnesses that were never there before. It's because, again, you know, when you... Someone once said to me, you shouldn't fish in the same well too often. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, you're constantly staying in the same gene pool, uh, somewhere along the line, the equalizer, which is Mother Nature, comes in and she, you know, cleans the board to start again. So you do need a bit of diversity. You do need to do it properly. You do need to open your lines every now and again. I'm not saying that you do need to cross to other, other breeds, but you need to be responsible with what you do. But uh, I think even the Kennel Club now, they've just brought in um, a rule against uh, inbreeding, mm -hmm. which is you know, maybe a little sort of too late. But you know, they're, they're showing that they kind of got their eye on the ball saying, you know, brother, sister and mother, son and all that lot you know, is no good now. So you're not allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. And they changed the other day the age of what age the bitch can have her first litter. So they they do change every now and again. They'll, they'll you know, look as though they're 
they, they've got their eye on the ball. But um, people need to kick up a, a lot of fuss before they take notice. But uh, again, that this is it's one of those ones where you could talk all day between the the show world of, of purebred dogs and the working lines. You know, it's uh, here in the country you have both. If you have a dog show here, you'll have the official dogs, and then you've got hunting dogs. Mm -hmm. So if I ever turn up, you know, I'll have a little quick nose at the what's going on with the show dogs, and I very quickly become disheartened, and so I get myself a beer and I go over and have a look at the hunting dogs. Okay. So, and that's the difference: is night and day. You know, there's the dogs that work and they're capable, and they've all been bred because they're capable, and there's the show ponies on the other side. So. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm anti anti show. I'm just being a realist, saying that a show only will give you twenty, thirty percent of the, the true potential of a dog. Right, right. What kind of dog that you've never uh, uh, had a lot of firsthand experience with? What kind of breed that you really are are kind of interested in, but you've never really seen up close? Uh, a breed that I would be interested in that I've never seen up close. Mm -hmm. um, Not necessarily that you would own, but just something that you that really interests you and you kind of like. And well, I, I, I've always been fascinated with. Uh, funnily enough, I was in a pub. Funnily enough, many many years ago, and a guy had an American Akita. Mm. And I'd never seen one before, and I was thinking, hey, that's, that looks like a jacked-up husky, you know, on steroids. And I was looking at this dog, and the dog was very aggressive, and suddenly managed to get out of its collar and decided to go into the crowd. <laughs> and you'd never seen, this was a crowd of football hooligans at the time, you'd never seen so many scared grown men in your life that the, the pub emptied within 30 seconds and they slammed the door and left the dog in with the landlord and i'll always remember that and i remember thinking geez that, that's a that's that's a dog that needs looking at I'm not saying i would have one it's not at all i don't like fluffy things but uh I always remember that and thinking, Jesus, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those ones where I'm thinking, that's a dog I need to one day have a little look at and see what it's all about. I know nothing, nothing at all. It's only the, that, that day in the pub <laughs> watching everybody make a fast exit out of windows and doors. That always left a, a, a kind of memory. But uh, I was, so when, when I get the time, I'll have a, have a little read up on that maybe visit the kennels and have a little look not that i would ever have one but just that that was one of the breeds and um what else have i got I, i'm a i would consider myself a a i would say a dogman because i am passionate about dogs mm -hmm. i love all dogs i mean if i am at a dog show I quickly vacate myself and go off on my own mm -hmm. to have a mooch about and I look at all of the different breeds and have a look. I mean, I remember looking at the fox terriers, the short-haired fox terriers at Crofts and thinking, don't they look smart? And funnily enough, all of the owners played the part. They all turned up in their tartan three-piece suits and stuff and, <laughs> and it, looked, it looked wonderful and I remember thinking, that's, that's really, they've got the spirit of the thing. You know, it's really, really good. And then I had a little look at the, the, the miniature bull terriers and thinking, they look fun, they look fun. Uh, and then I was over, what was I looking at? Wheaton terriers, show Wheatons compared to the, the, the working Wheatons. So I, I like, I'm a fan of nice, nicely bred dogs. There are many breeds that I appreciate, but that's not to say that I would.